It's, it's my pleasure to, uh, to have here uh, Dr. Federico Levi. He is a physicist uh, as well, and uh, uh, is right now a senior editor at Nature Physics, but it, he has uh, previous experience uh, uh, in Nature Communications, that is the interdisciplinary journal of, uh, of the Nature Group. And uh, before that, he got uh, his PhD in physics, uh, in quantum physics, actually, quantum information. Mm -hmm. uh, at the University of Freiburg yep. and got his degree in physics in Milan. So he's Italian and uh, we are very happy to have him here today because uh, he will let us know a bit better uh, what, what it means to publish in Nature from the side of the editor, so from the publisher uh, side. So he will give also some very nice uh, uh, suggestions. I have seen a similar uh, talk uh, in, um, previously in, uh, in, in a couple of conferences, and I think that this is very useful for our community of researchers here at FBK to know what is uh, going to say. So thank you again for coming. Uh, yeah, thank you, Manlio, for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks for the kind introduction and for inviting me here. Thanks for setting up expectations for the talk. Um, it's always very, <laughs> very, very helpful. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about a few a few things today, but uh, first of all, feel free to you know ask questions during the talk and comments. If you disagree, let me know. It's fine. We can talk about things, um, and I will try to speed things up as possible because I think it's interesting to have a bit of Q and A at the end if you want. Um, so. What I'm going to try and talk about today, I, I think reflects a lot the philosophy of the place where we are at the moment. So as Manuel said, I'm a physicist and I work at Nature Physics, um, but I will also touch upon a few other journals that perhaps are a bit more um, of interest to some of you who are not uh, working in physics actively. However, just to get started, um, one question for the physicists in the audience, but not only. How many papers do you think are published in physics every year? Just to get an idea, I want you to, talk, to think about two numbers, right? One is how many papers you roughly believe are published in physics every year. Of course, you know, we can talk about whether, how we define physics, but just to get an idea. And the second number is how many do you read? What do you think? Give me a, a, a rough order of magnitude for the first one, in your opinion. In physics, no, in any, any you know, on the archive. Four zeros, okay, 10,000, more, and how many do you read, roughly? We can also worry about what reading means later, <laughs> but um, 50, okay? Abstract, maybe, a few more? <laughs> okay, so, um, of course, Answering the first question accurately would need, you know, Manlio and his group to work for a bit, but a rough estimation, in 2016 there were published over 30,000, at the very least. This is a conservative estimation. Here I put a number of random journals that publish a few papers, just to get a feeling. Um, and according to a survey that Nature ran a few years ago, people say, researchers say that they read 264 papers a year. Um, Again, what exactly reading means, we can, we can worry about that later. Anyway, the point that I want to make here is, as you are all very, very well aware, there is a massive amount of literature out there. Um, and, and the way that the literature is organized is either on preprint servers or published in various journals by various publishers. So you might be familiar with a number of these. And so basically, these are the people who try to uh, work with this massive amount of information and kind of try to organize it a bit in a bit more readable format. You probably know some of them, if not all of them, um, and each of them has their own you know, approach and they, their objectives and their ethos in terms of, let's say, how they publish science and how they work with you. Um, I'm going to focus on how we do things at Nature, uh, and of course you will see that there will be similarities and differences, but I'm not going to really make comparisons here. Um, to give you a little bit of a, of a context, so the way nature has been set up, what is now 150 years ago, the idea was that um, this, is the, this is the first issue of nature ever published, and uh, if, you actually, if you actually look at what the mission was back then, uh, they say essentially two things. They say that nature's mission is to place before the general public the result of scientific discovery, 
And the second one is to help scientists learn about, all adva about advances in all branches of natural knowledge. So if you want, is essentially two points. One is, let's make the people aware of the fantastic work that is being done by our scientists and help scientists talk to one another and learn what the other scientists are, are doing. Uh, of course, in 150 years, the way you actually do this has changed quite substantially. And by now, we, um, as, you, as you probably know, we have quite a few journals. 150 years ago was, of course, only Nature. Now we have a bunch of them. But let's say the idea is still this one. And I'll try to, talk, try to kind of walk you how we actually implement this vision these days. But before we, we delve into the details, let's say the, the, the kind of the, fo the focal points of what makes a Nature Journal, um, and with Nature Journals, I mean journals that have nature in their title. As you probably know, like us as a company, we publish a number of different journals, maybe scientific reports or other journals. Uh, but I'm not going to really talk about them in, in, in the talk of today. So the whole idea of the way we publish, the way we think we, we do things, let's say, the best way we can, is to try and really present scientists with an accurate or, let's say, very narrow selection of what we feel is what, in, in essentially, the, 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 the research results that really are worth your time knowing about. So the idea we have is that what we like to publish is a very selected ensemble of results which we feel are going to really make your time, are going to be worth your time. And the idea is that to do this, we have um, teams of professional editors with academic backgrounds. So I used to be a researcher. As Manu said, I did my PhD in, in physics and I worked there for a bit. Um, but then at some point I stopped being a researcher and now I'm an, an editor full time as are all my colleagues. So we are all former scientists who stopped carrying out actual research to become full-time editors. Um, and our journals are all run by us. We do not have editorial boards, and we do not have society affiliation. In some cases, some journals may have consulting editorial boards to get a bit of feedback from the community, but all the decisions, as I'm going to explain you in a moment, are really taken by the editors. So we are the ones that decide what ultimately gets published in these, in these journals. Um, without really going too much into the details, of course, this is quite different from the model of many other journals, and there are pros and cons to both of them. But this is kind of like the nature recipe, if you want. Um, and we kind of value our editorial independence, even internally. Different nature journals are independent from one another, and we maintain this. If you want, we actually compete against one another if you're, if, in, in, some, in some sense. Um, so just to kind of quickly walk you through a few of these titles to give you a sense of like how we see our, um, let's say, our ensemble of journals. You're probably familiar with Nature, um, which, is, which is a weekly journal and uh, publishes roughly 800 so papers per year. Then we have what we call the Nature branded research journals. So one of them is Nature Physics, but there are a few others. I'm going to talk about them in a moment. And then we have Nature Communications, which, as Manu discussed, is interdisciplinary, so they publish across all the sciences. They are daily and online only, and they publish um, more, than few, more than a few thousand papers per year by now. So the, the rationale behind these journals, um, which gets translated in the way us as editors really do our job on a daily basis, is um, that people in nature really try to publish what they feel is the most significant, the most impactful, and the most important scientific achievement produced by the various research communities. Um, so this is really the way an editor thinks about the papers they are about to publish. They read papers and they think, is this going to be interesting to my audience? My audience wants to read the most significant advances produced by scientists these days. Is this potentially one of them? Um, so this is kind of the mindset we have. I'm going to tell you a bit more in the detail in, 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 the detail in a moment. Um, so of course, one step below, if we want, the, the breadth of the results get a bit narrow. So essentially, the idea is like, OK, maybe there is some amazing results in physics, which you know it's just not going to be of interest to anybody out there. But it's probably something that physicists will still appreciate. And that's the sort of results that nature physics is aiming at publishing. So something that is worth the interest of a narrower community. 
And, uh, and these journals, the research journals, really try to focus their message to specific communities. What these communities are, I'm going to talk about in a second. And the concept of community, of course, is changing over time. And I think that's an interesting development in the world of publishing. And finally, nature communication is one step narrower again. So perhaps it's going to tailor their papers to something that is of interest to a, you know, a subset of the community, say you know, quantum information theory rather than quantum physics, if you want. Um, of course, the, 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 the idea is that we have all these journals, but, but we really want authors to be the ones that ultimately decide where they want to send their work. We really think deeply about the audiences that these journals cater to, and so we want you to be empowered to decide where you want to send your paper and who do you want to talk to. So the decision is always going to be yours where to send the paper. Um, in terms of selecting the audience you think this work is going to be interested for, interesting for. Um, for the moment, the only journal that offers an open access option across all these is Nature Communications. If you've been following what the European Union has been doing, maybe things will change at some point. But for the moment, it's still only Nature Communications. Um, so here in the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on this mid-level tier, because this is where I work, and I think there are some interesting developments undergoing here, but most of the things I'm going to say apply across, across the board. Um, so as I said, these research journals are really trying to, to talk to specific communities. And of course, the kind of communities that we, we cater to changes over time. So the first journals in this, in this tier have been created in the life sciences, and you know, they, by now they date for mo more than 30 years. And you, know, you have something like biotechnology, genetics, cell biology, neuroscience. So in a sense, very, very traditional life sciences disciplines. Um, a little bit later, we developed the same kind of journals in the natural sciences, in the physical sciences, sorry. And again, it's quite traditional materials, physics, geoscience. These are strong communities that still exist, and we want to you know, continue serving them. We want to publish interesting physics that physicists will appreciate. Um, but over time, I think particularly more recently, and again, the place where we are, I think it's testament to that to a certain extent, research is you know, increasingly less fit to be kind of pigeonholed in these very traditional categories of you know, departments or disciplines. And, and in that sense, I think we found that it's helpful to start promote, if you want, to start creating a home for communities that are perhaps kind of orthogonal to this sort of splitting. So in the last few years, we started publishing some journals which we call kind of science, applied sciences, but you, know, you can call them however you want. And the idea is that these are kind of transdisciplinary, focused on specific subsets of what people have been doing. So you know, something like electronics, of course, is not a new discipline, but electronics has contribution from a number of different disciplines that people are used to work together but they probably faced a number of challenges in terms of where do we publish our results when we work in electronics. Um, and also, these kind of journals follow quite closely the trend of what uh, society, if you want, is more concerned with. So a journal on machine intelligence is quite clearly very timely, given the kind of challenges and interests that the current society is facing. Um, parallel to this, to this effort, I think it's interesting the fact that in the last years, again, we have started publishing what we call thematic journals. So these ones are journals that, whose objective is really creating a community around issues that, for whose resolution, if you want, probably an interdisciplinary effort is required. And, and the idea is really to kind of foster a dialogue between disciplines that maybe traditionally have been a bit separated. So if you take a journal like Nature Energy, which is now around since three years, and if you flip through the pages, you really can find going from you know, material synthesis of efficient solar cells to policy on how to not pollute or waste energy when you know, using fuels of some sorts. So it's really kind of a different spectrum of disciplines that are tr trying to, bring to, get, to brought together, be brought together in order to foster dialogue to tackle these challenges. And I think that this is an interesting way to see how publishing is going, the direction in which research is going. And I think we're trying to sort of like favor the development of society in this sense. So I hope that this is going to be of interest for, for, for some of you, given the place where we are. Just as a case study, I wanted to, I asked my colleague at Nature Machine Intelligence to give me a bit of a feeling of what they do. Nature Machine Intelligence exists since six months. So 
it's a bit new, they are trying to find their footing. Um, but really their idea is that they want to, on the one hand, you know, the traditional, what you would expect such a journal to publish. So science and engineering of intelligent machines, such as, you know, from deep learning to natural language processing, brain machine interfaces, robotics, and so on. So traditional, um, you know, if you want hardware development in a sense. But at the same time, they also want to consider and discuss the, the wider implications of results and progress in the context of AI and similar. So discussions around ethics or human-robot interaction, discussing how work, the future of work, is going to be impacted by developments in, in intelligent machines, and equally how other traditional disciplines of science are influenced by these developments. So, I hope this kind of gives you an, an idea of how, when, bring, when creating one of these journals, really the idea is to kind of foster discussion of all the important issues that surround a given, a given topic. Um, now, how exactly do we do this, right, in our, in, in our everyday job? Um, so, I mean, before I say that, in a sense, the question is kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm answering the question already because, of course, one, one important question that I think is very relevant to think about is whether we still need journals at all. I don't know what is your opinion. Of course, my opinion has to be a given one, otherwise I'm out of a job. But, um, but you know, at the end of the day, most, most people just Google their results or they just click on the links given in the references. You have archive, you have preprints. So what exactly are journals um, doing still around? And, and you know, like the answer we give, and I hope I kind of gave you an idea, is really to help convey results to the right audience. And in this, we try to give a number of different options to really talk to different communities. And the idea is really to sort of curate results, highlight what we feel is the most important um, outcome of research, and ha help cross-fertilize different fields. Um, really, so the way we see ourselves is really to kind of support you, researchers, in creating a narrative and helping the development of the narrative of a given field. Um, and you know, this is something we can, we can talk about later if you want, but I think that I would stress that we don't want to impose a narrative. I think we are here to sort of help you create one. Um, and so essentially, how do we do this? Of course, you are familiar with the papers we publish, so research articles are the bulk of what we do. But our journals, and nature is shaped in a similar way, do actually include quite a few more, um, uh, as a much broader range of content. Um, and research articles are certainly the most substantial part, but it's just one of them. And so we really have a few tools at our disposal in terms of creating this narrative and supporting the narrative of a given field. So we have commentaries, highlights, reviews, and perspectives. I just, I'm just going to give you uh, a few examples to maybe give you an idea of what I mean. Um, and so for instance, and, and this will depend a lot on the audience that the journal is trying to talk to or cater for. So, for instance, you can have, in, in nature physics, you can have something discussing job opportunities that come from the world of quantum physics, or you can just discuss an interesting history, like looking back at how general relativity was first discovered, or you can have something which is a bit more technical, and it's about how CERN, the structure at CERN in terms of data deposition and um, analysis structure, helps reproducibility. So, Maybe you've heard about how uh, you know, committed CERN is on reproducible and open research. Here is where they talk about how they actually do it in practice. Um, you can touch upon, uh, we, we have discussed how, you know, what physicists can do in the world of data and how, you know, um, how the physics mindset interfaces with the world of data sets in, in a way that is quite peculiar. And you know, this is the sort of wider issues that we feel we are sort of helping discuss. Um, and again, you know, like the role that physics can play in terms of developing some um, useful tools for understanding forecasts in society. And of course, this is nature physics. And then you can have nature machine intelligence, which can discuss issues such as reproducibility in the robotics research. They can discuss um, the, the, you know, the developments in the context of self-driving cars, uh, drug design, how you know, AI methods can help drug design, or this is a great title, by the way. I, I, um, this is in terms of understanding how human bias gets translated into um, machine, machine learning biases. And again, 
Another journal which I think might be interesting to highlight very briefly here is, is Nature Human Behavior, which exists since a couple of years. And again, it's another example of a very interdisciplinary field in which many different researchers from economics, from neuroscience, from psychology come together and tackle some of the most important problems we have at the moment. And so, again, just to give you an, an idea of how diverse the set of issues that they touch upon is, you, you know, you can have like cooperation, paranoia, mental health, the, uh, climate democracy, uh, democracy and climate governance. So these are really the sort of like, I just want to give you an idea of the spread of topics that can be touched upon by any of these journals and how they try to kind of create a sense of community by showing what other researchers in this world are doing. And this is really what we feel it's, you know, the way we can help uh, the development of science in a sense. Of course, you know, I'm not going to delve too much on this, but, you know, we do publish papers, which again are the, 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 the kind of like the bedrock on which we found our results. And uh, the moment you publish something which you feel could be quite, quite remarkable, such as this is a paper that reported how we actually are getting close to having enough sensitivity to carry out a tomography of Earth, so measuring the mass of Earth by looking at the neutrino absorptions of neutrinos flying through it, which to me at least seems quite a, an interesting achievement. And so we can commission a number of comments that can help non-specialists grasp a bit better the meaning of these results. So it's really an idea, like the idea of these journals is to create surrounding the research enough material to allow everybody to get a sense of what's being achieved. Um, and to do this in a larger scale, we also, we also publish special issues, so maybe an, a set of longer pieces or comments or reviews, all surrounded, surrounding a, spe a specific topic. So in Nature Physics, we published one on nuclear fusion or quantum materials, just as an example. Um, so let me get now a bit more specific, also to fulfill what Mahalia was saying in terms of giving you advice. Before I do that, just, I, I want to just kind of like quickly jump through a number of, 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 of things that I feel are either often um, misconstrued about us, and also it's a number of things that we have started doing in the last few years that many people are not really familiar with, and I think are really cool, so I'm just gonna kind of throw them at you quickly. Well, the first one is, how we work with preprints. There is still this kind of mystery about whether putting a paper on the archive is gonna um, compromise the chances to be published in Nature. That's not true. We're very happy for you to publish on, on archive at any time. And actually, our, our colleagues in Nature Machine Intelligence have managed to persuade the people who do the websites to actually link published papers to their archive version in case you do not have access to the journal. So, we're really trying to foster the interaction and, and development of preprints on our side for what is possible. A nice initiative that I want to highlight quickly is uh, uh, the fact that we allow anybody who has access to our journals to share papers with anybody else. So of course, as you know, nature is behind the paywall. So if you do not have access, you can't read it. Um, the idea of this thing is that if you have access, you can use that button at the bottom to generate a link that you can send to anybody, you know, your grandmother or whatever, and they can actually read the paper for free. So this is a very nice initiative that really helps people spread the word about their research or other interesting research. You can put it on Twitter, you can put it on Facebook, whatever, send it to your friends. So really the idea is that, yes, there is a paywall, but we really try to, you know, well, I don't want to say get around it because we kind of do the paywall, but um, the idea is really to do not make paywalls a real massive obstacle to the diffusion of science. So take advantage of this if you have access. Yes? No, this one is behind the paywall. Yes. You can also share it with any, any, anybody, any, any of your friends or whatever. So if you send the link, you know, the HTML, if you do not have access, you cannot read it. But if you use this link, you will actually be able to read it. So that's the idea of, you know, if you have a colleague that can't read it, or if you have a friend that can't read it, or if you have, you know, somebody that you want to be able to read your research, you can use this link. And not just your research, anything on nature, nature physics, whatever. So the idea is really like to give you an opportunity to spread research more widely. And, uh, and you know, this, 
So this is, this is, you know, if you want to have some numbers and some data interesting about like what were the most shared articles you can get on this link. But you know, last year, this thing was used 3.2 million times. So people are really taking advantage of this and I think we're very happy with that. So, you know, the thing is that this link is really at the bottom of the paper. So, you know, but go there and use it. <laughs> um, and I think that this is a nice initiative. Uh, just quickly mentioning the fact that we are trying to foster transparency. So we now uh, ask everybody that publishes with us to declare if and where the data supporting the research is available and the code. At this stage, we don't mandate data availability, but we ask you to say where it is. And if it's not available, to state as much. So the hope is that you know, we kind of nudge you into, hey, you know, maybe you want to share it. Um, uh, another interesting thing we're doing at the moment, well, interesting or controversial, depends a bit on how, what, how you see it, but since a couple of years, we are starting to ask reviewers who referee for us whether they would be fine being thanked in the paper. So if you scroll to the bottom of the paper, you might find something like this. Nature Physics thanks this guy and other anonymous reviewers for their help. So this is a, a way to give some credit to peer reviewers who help us. Um, again, here are all the data. Down below you find all the data if you're interested in that, but roughly 50% of the people we asked them, that, like referees, we asked, are you okay to be thanked? They, did, they were thanked. You know, make of this what you want. Could be a good step towards accreditation, could be a good step towards transparency, or could be a terribly st step in the wrong direction. Up, up to you. But this is something that we're trying. Um, finally, the last thing. I'm not sure how many of you are in the context of social science, but I think I want to highlight this because I think it's a very nice initiative of nature human behavior. And they are, they are essentially working with something that is called a register report. And in particular in social science, there is an issue which is publication bias. So let's say you do a statistical campaign to find bias in hiring in a certain field, and you find nothing. Then you will go, oh, if I don't find anything, I mean, nobody's going to publish me. So you start you know, playing a bit with the statistics to make something come out. To avoid something like this, essentially what they do is they allow people to submit what is a proposal for a, for a, for a, you know, for a research campaign. And the paper gets accepted before you get results if the analysis, let's say, if the perspective analysis is interesting enough and if it sounds robust enough. If that's good enough, you know, the paper will go, the, the journal will go, we're going to publish you independently of what you find as long as it's, you know, statistically robust and technically meaningful. And so this is an interesting way to actually sort of like avoid the fact that somebody wants to find a signal where there is none. And they have started publishing a few papers essentially reporting nothing, for instance, in terms of, I think they found no gender bias in grant funding committees in the US, something like that. And again, it was set up in this way. So people, the, the paper was accepted before the results came in. And I think it's an interesting way. Of course, you know, maybe in physics this is not particularly applicable, but I think it's an interesting way. And I think showcases a bit the way we, as journals, work with different communities by offering you know, different options. Um, so, yeah, I, this is just a few examples of the things we're trialing or we're trying to do to kind of improve or innovate, if you want, publishing a bit. But now let me get to the black box, which is maybe what Mario was alluding to, which is essentially what happens when you send us a paper, right? So what do we do every day of our lives? Um, I'm happy to take questions at the end. Uh, you know, I will not be able to touch upon anything, everything, but you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this. Um, so in, in, in a nutshell, the way a journal, the way a nature journal works is that you put together your paper, you give it a nice title, and, um, and, you, and you send it to us. So when you, when you submit a paper to us, this lands in the journal inbox. As I said, our journals are all independent, which means that I have no idea what's in nature's inbox, or I have no idea what's in nature human behavior's inbox. I just know what's in nature physics inbox. And then what happens is that an editor gets assigned to this paper. So a single editor is going to be responsible for that paper for its whole trajectory uh, in our journal. So the way this works is that each of us editors have a certain brief. So we are responsible for a certain area of, well, physics in my case, or a certain set, subset of human behavior in the case of that journal. Of course, this is related to what we studied. 
um, or the kind of career, academic career we did, but of course the more experienced you become, the more broad you become as an editor. Um, and this person is going to read all the papers that come in in that field. So, um, for instance, in nature physics, keeping in mind that we cover all of physics and we read all the papers, how many, pap how many editors do you think we are and how many papers do you think we read? People who know don't answer. Just I want the ones that need to guess. Nature physics, yeah. 2,000 papers yearly. And how many is a reasonable amount of papers per editor? So we can then... Per year. 100 papers per year. So that would be two a week. Hmm? 50 papers per year. No, I'm just asking. Yeah. You still have to decide to send it out. Or... Yes, so I need to read it and decide what to do. 50 per year. No. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> <It's not. laughs> um, so over, overall, uh, we are seven. Uh, and we read around about 10, paper, 10 new papers per week, which means you know 500 papers per year, per editor. Well, the chief editor gets a little fewer. Uh, but you see, each of us is responsible for quite a broad span of physics. But that's inevitable with the sort of, of, of work we do. And if you want, it's also the reason why we sign up in the first place. But as you see, you know, each of us follows a certain field. What I cover is quantum theory, particularly on the information front, complex systems, and statistical physics. And you know, we have people doing plasma, high energy, and astrophysics. CONMAT requires a full person because it's a ridiculous amount, and so on and so forth. So each of these people will be responsible for our content in that specific field, and they will get the papers submitted at the beginning. So then what this person is going to do is, as you already, already uh, you know, flagged, this person will take a, a first editorial decision. So the idea here is we read the paper and we read the related literature, and we try to establish whether this piece of, of research is potentially going to be of interest to our readers. So if it does satisfy our editorial criteria. The idea is really to try and understand how original this is. So what has been done before in this context? What is this, the new step that is being provided in this paper? What is the degree of advance that this offers over the state of the art? Once you figure this out, then you make uh, an editorial call and you try to establish, okay, how much is the potential of this new bit of information to influence the thinking in the field and to potentially generate new work and stimulate new research. Um, of course, uh, we also consider you know, how many people will be actually interested in the message, how broad is the, resu the result, how practical this potentially is. And of course, you know, there are a number of things in here which require quite some digging. And some of these points are clearly subjective. And I'm sure that you know, if I give you a paper and I ask to 20 of you what you think, we will get roughly 15 different answers. Um, but the idea is really that we try quite hard to narrow down the subjective bit as much as possible. So we really try to take an informed decision by looking and studying related literature and understanding what is being done in practice in the paper. I'm not going to try to sell you that there is no subjective part, because that is not the case. But we really try to sort of narrow that as much as possible. Um, I want to stress the fact that this is an editorial, editorial assessment. So we are essentially taking at face value what researchers send us. If you tell us that you did something and there is a reasonable degree of certainty that this is in the paper, we're not going to check your plots to see whether that is really the signal you claim you have is really going to be in the plots. That's something that is of technical nature and will be checked by a referee. This is an editorial assessment in terms of the potential interest of the paper. Um, we really try quite hard to distinguish the two things. Despite the fact that you know, I have worked in quantum information, it is not my job to take a quantum information paper and go, this is wrong. I, I don't do that. That's, that's not my role. Of course, if you say you've done something and there is not even one plot, maybe you know, let's, let's talk about that. But when, when, when it's evident, we can talk about it. But you know, the subtleties of whether an actual result is there, that's not something that we establish. Um, so in general, this is clearly a very 
I would say it's what many people struggle with, and uh, the, the, if you want, is, is a very con contentious point in some sense. So just to give you an idea of how can you help us do our job as easily as possible. Now, the point is, as trained editors, we really try to delve in the results of a paper. So the fact that you write it nicely and with very kind of Shakespeare-inspired English is not particularly crucial. Um, and we really try to understand what is the substance of a paper without worrying too much about the presentation. However, if the, if the way a paper is written makes it really hard for us to understand what's been done, then you know, we might miss it. And in that sense, it is quite important and it's quite helpful if you can be quite clear in terms of what you're doing, why you're doing it, in which way you know, is this advancing our understanding of something. You know, what is the main advance? What do we learn that is new? And why is that, in your opinion, going to be helpful to this, to this field of science? Now, the idea is that, particularly for journals that have a broad readership, such as Nature or even Nature Physics, providing some context is actually very helpful. No matter the fact that you, know, you are an expert and you know perfectly inside out all the subtleties of the actual state of the art in you know, whatever, single photon sources or you know, quantum something, maybe people that are just a little, like one or two steps away from you, they might not really be completely up to date as to why this is so important and what are the potential applications of this. So giving context and trying to put yourself in the shoes of readers who are not experts is actually very helpful. Just to give you a bit of a feeling, our papers, I think that a good way to shape our papers is to imagine kind of a hourglass um, shape. So introductions and, and conclusion should be something that you know even non-specialists can kind of follow. So they kind of understand why is this an interesting research avenue and why this paper is doing a good service to it. Then of course in the middle of it you want the meat. You want the results, you want the math, which is going to be probably of interest to specialists. And that's fine, that should be there. So don't make it a fairy tale, but try to balance what is technical and what is not. Um, the idea is that results should speak for themselves. No matter how many creative adverbs and adjectives you throw in there, something is not going to be remarkable just because you say it, or it's going to pave the way to this or pave the way to that. Um, the idea is really make us understand why what you've done is nice, but make the results speak for themselves. And again, we, I know that we have you know, kind of a reputation about being quite demanding in terms of formatting. That is not really the case, particularly at this first stage of decision, we're not really going to worry about, oh, you know, your abstract is 250 words, sorry, I'm not going to take it. But that really is not, that's not really our concern. But of course, within reason, if our final paper has four figures and you send one with 20, well, it's just going to be very different. So don't waste weeks trying to nail the perfect length of the abstract. That's not particularly important. We're going to help you put together the paper at the end. So essentially what happens is that we take this first decision and depending on the journal, on the discipline, roughly eight, 80 to 85% of the submissions are returned to the author at this stage. Now what I want to, I, I, I hope I, I gave you an idea is we spend quite some time trying to figure out whether a paper is potentially interesting for us enough. So this is not tossing a coin and going, sorry, it's not your lucky day. And we try to give a bit of feedback in emails to authors to convey the rationale behind our decisions. The problem is that if you give too much feedback, people just argue to death with us. And you know, it's like, you know, because we think this is not good enough, and they go, oh, yeah, I understand, but what about this? And you know, 20 emails for every paper. So our emails tend to be a bit vague on purpose. I'm sorry about that, but it's just not manageable otherwise. However, if you want to know a bit more about a given decision, please email us. We're human beings and we're happy to talk to you. So if you want to get a bit of more feedback in terms of like what you think was missing, please get in touch. You know, maybe we're not going to answer straight away, but we're going to tell you. And we're going to be happy to, to discuss this. Um, so in case you are among the 15 to 20% that makes it through, then the step afterwards is peer review. Uh, so peer review, actually, interestingly, is something that is not being around at Nature particularly since a very long time. In the good old days, well, in, in the old days, at Nature, you know, these people in, in, in England would just sit around and discuss about papers very freely, all men, of course, all white. Um, now things are a bit different, and from 67, everything is peer-reviewed. 
Uh, now we offer blind, double blind peer review and transparent peer review at Nature Communications. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but if you have, ask me later if you are interested in this. But overall, at Nature, peer review is quite an editor intensive process. Again, we spend quite some time trying to find the right referees. So we try to assemble a team of referees that is going to help us understand whether this paper has, first of all, the robustness necessary to be published, and secondly, whether it is going to be of potential interest to our, author, to our readers. So we assemble people that usually have very different expertise in terms of being able to comment on different aspects of the paper. So you know, maybe if you have a paper that uses a certain experimental technique, you want somebody that is an expert of that. Even if this person has nothing to do with what is being done specifically in the paper, maybe you want just you know, somebody to tell you, yeah, this data is, is legit, is robust. Um, so different experts belong to different fields, and it's not always obvious that they are all from the same context. We look for people that have no uh, conflict of interest, and uh, overall, you know, we are hopefully, I mean, ideal, in an ideal world, we try to get to fair-minded, constructive, and efficient people that do everything on time and are helpful. This doesn't always turn out to be the case, but we really try our best to kind of mediate the peer review. And, you know, after a few years in this work, you kind of know your field, and you get, start to getting to know the people who are more or less helpful. And you know, without overburdening them, you try to you know you get a feeling of who's going to be constructive. At the same time, however, we really try to always find always trying to find new reviewers. We don't want to make Nature Physics you know kind of like the journal of the twenty big PIs in Princeton who decides everything. So we're really happy to go to younger people. Um, and often we try to mix, in terms of referees, old and young, to get different perspectives of a, or a given research, or, or a given result. And of course, you know, we try to always diversify our pool of reviewers. So this is a, a plot. This is an, an analysis we did for our 10th anniversary in 2015. So x-axis is the number of papers that a given person has reviewed, and on the y-axis is how many people did that. So just a handful of people reviewed more than 10 papers in 10 years for Nature Physics. And often this was because they maybe reviewed two or three papers at the same time that came in together. But you know, I hope this shows that the majority of our referees reviewed once or twice per us, for, for us per year. So we really try to look for feedback across the whole world of physics. And other journals do essentially the same. So it's really quite important to you know, keep changing our reviewer pool. Um, you know, we contact referees, hopefully they say yes, I'm going to help you with this paper. We ask them to return comments in three weeks, they never do. So typically you get something back in four to five. Um, and then you look at, 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 at reports, and again, this is an editorial decision of what you want to do with the paper given these reports. What we do is not really counting votes, so it's not really about two against one, sorry, you're out, or you're two thumbs up and one thumbs down, great, you made it. But really, since we have people with different backgrounds, we really try to integrate their comments weighted on the background they have in terms of understanding what the paper is telling us. So the editor kind of takes all this feedback into account and makes a decision. Often, these kind of decisions involve more than one editor to discuss things. So really, what we look for yeah, um, roughly 50% of papers get rejected at this stage. But what is, I think it's interesting is, you know, when we assess referee report, it's really a matter of trying to understand the degree to which criticisms appear to affect the validity of, of the conclusions. Often you get referee reports which are like, this paper is amazing, it's groundbreaking, it's going to be so helpful, but, you know, I mean, it's written in a confusing way, so reject it. And you go like, well, you know, we can work on that. We, we can change the way it's written if you actually feel that this is going to be amazing. So we really try to understand what the opinion of the referee is, regardless of what their judgment, overall judgment is. And really sometimes, well, I would say most of the times, referees disagree. And so you really need to kind of understand, OK, why do you think it's not particularly innovative? Why do you think it's innovative? Sometimes we actually exchange a couple of emails with them to sort of flesh out their position. And we try to find you know, a reasoned decision. Of course, this is quite time intensive, and not always we want to take as much time on the referees and on the authors. So we, do, we are mindful of times. We don't want to hold your papers for too long. But we really try to kind of make an educated decision on the paper based on the various points of view. Um, we often overrule referees in terms of editorial matters. So if a referee says, this is you know, solid, but I think it's boring, 
I can decide, well, my opinion, this is not boring, so I'm going to publish it. But I'm never going to overrule a referee that says, this, I don't think that this is right. I don't think that this is solid. Which then creates a number of problems because we might bring, out, bring in somebody else to check whether the referee is right and so on. So it gets a bit tricky, but we are really hesitant to you know, swipe under the carpet uh, technical issues. But we overrule editorial ones. One thing is we try to avoid multiple type, uh, rounds of review, so we are really keen on making papers converge quickly. If they, it seems like things are taking forever, maybe it's not really for us. Mostly because we don't really want to keep you, you know, preventing you from publishing your paper for two years or whatever, and endlessly bothering everybody in terms of like referees keeping reading things and so on. Um, yeah, so essentially this is kind of the life cycle of a paper, and roughly a number between 5 and 10% of all our initial submissions make it to acceptance. If a paper doesn't make it, um, no is not the end necessarily. So uh, everybody has the right to appeal our decisions. And this is quite a common thing. Okay, so there is this word appeal that everybody is a bit scared about, right? Oh my God, I'm going to upset the editor. No. It's a very common thing. We get them all the time, and they are you know, a resource that authors have to point out any flaws in the process. So you know, don't be afraid of doing this. Um, now, the thing is, um, decisions, like, decisions who are based on editorial matters such as, I don't think that this is an important result enough in some sense, that's a bit difficult for you to argue against, right? I'm the editor, I make a decision, you argue against me. If it's just my word against yours, we're not going to go any very far. So what helps is actually if you flag you know, technical or scientific matters that were factually wrong. For instance, a referee didn't understand what you did, or a referee misunderstood your plot. I have no idea that that was the case, again, or maybe I have an idea, but I'm not going to take a technical stance. So please tell us, if you feel that the decision has been put on factually incorrect ground, let us know, and we're happy to reconsider. If you actually, you know, referees go like, oh, you will never be able to do this, and you can actually do it, that's something that you want to bring to our attention. But overall, the idea is, in appealing, try to be factual, scientific, and present data to make your point. What doesn't help very much in appealing is telling us or referees that we're idiots, that's not going to be very helpful. It happens a lot, but it's not helpful. Um, you know, just changing the abstract and going, oh, yeah, I changed the abstract, would you publish this? And you go like, well, that's not really going to make a big difference. Telling us, you know, that everybody at conference was blown away with what you did. And I'm sure, and there is, you know, this, we, I want to stress that this is never a matter of like your research is not important or it's inconsequential. It's just a matter of we have a certain audience we want to talk to and we want to represent a certain kind of science. The fact that you know, what you are sending us doesn't fit in that, it doesn't belittle at all the importance of the science in itself. So don't take it you know, in, in the wrong way. Another option in, in case the paper doesn't get accepted is transfers. So given that we have this big stable of, of, of journals, you can move your paper through them. And the idea is that this is hopefully going to find a home for your paper more quickly than otherwise. This is something that you can do whenever you want, but sometimes we talk to our colleagues at other journals to facilitate this. You can, uh, when you submit a paper, you can tell us, I don't want you to talk to anybody, and there is a box that you can click, and if you do, I'm not going to talk about your paper to anybody else. But essentially, you can transfer your paper before it has been reviewed, and this might come with you know, a suggestion. But this is, you know, I think that this is very nice. Different journals have different audiences, and there is really no downside in transferring internally after the paper has not been peer reviewed. If the paper has been peer reviewed, the reports are going to be transferred with them. So that's a good way to get things faster through the system, because peer review doesn't get started again. But on the other hand, if the reports were bad, you have the option of not transferring. So you just can resubmit the paper, and nobody's going to know that you were rejected in Nature if you submit the Nature Physics. So keep that in mind as an option. Um, with this in mind, uh, I hope this was a bit useful. I'm happy to take questions, and I'm around the whole day. I don't know what's the plan, but you know, I'm happy to talk to anybody. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. I think you wait. I think a microphone is coming. 
I can hear you, but I think it's... Uh... Okay, so uh, the first thing is that uh, often uh, when I read papers, the impression is that uh, a large majority of papers have to have a very massive uh, supplementary information. Mm -hmm. the, the impression is that the paper that is published has to be a big research with many uh, smaller details that have to be put in somewhere in the uh, supplementary information. Right. And what is your uh, your point yeah. on this? Is this true or... Uh, so you're somehow... Okay. So essentially, if, if you want one, one... What you're saying is that sometimes it feels that the real paper is the supplementary information almost. Is that something that you feel is the case as well? Sometimes it's almost as if the supplementary information is the real paper. I was just uh, the impression yeah. is that uh, one has to demonstrate a large amount yeah. of uh, material right. uh, available, but only uh, like 3,000 uh, words to be published as no, an no, article, exactly. and the rest is... Uh, I, I see what you said. No, no, yeah, I agree. I wouldn't say it's mandatory, but it's certainly becoming something that is quite common. Um, so the, the rationale behind having a paper that remains short is that I think that this makes it more readable and we want to make people, you know, we want people to be able to read your paper and go and delve into the additional things as they want. Because I'm sure that, you know, I'm not sure what's, what's your stance, but, you know, if I send you a paper and go, oh, read this, this is very interesting, you click on the PDF and it's 35 pages, you go, oh, shit. You know, whereas if it's four pages, maybe you kind of sc scroll through it and then you go, oh, that, this is interesting. And then, you know, you kind of get into it. So we think that this kind of modular approach to papers can be helpful to readers. Um, it is true that sometimes, you know, what the kind of maybe like the level of, 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 of strength of our analysis requires a lot of additional things. This depends a lot on the field and depends a lot on the research. Sometimes, you know, you have a very, you know, sometimes simple enough ideas you know, get a lot of exposure because they're good. Sometimes, you know, maybe you want your research is good because maybe it's a very comprehensive characterization of something that is going to be a reference for the community. Well, that necessarily comes with a massive overhead. It is becoming like that. We are aware of it. Um, and I understand it's tricky for people to organize things. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a skill that needs to be developed. Yeah. Can I have the second question? Uh, how do you choose the referees? Should they uh, be people that are uh, continuously authorities that are publishing in nature, in science, mm -hmm. and uh, other things, or you can pick up also? So we usually, I mean, the, the way we do it, we try, to, uh, we try to kind of find a bit of a compromise. So from experience, if I take three authoritative senior people that publish in nature all the time, they will give me three very short and terrible reports. So that's useless. At the same time, of course, maybe having one authoritative person that can give you a bit of the overview could be helpful. So you probably want to balance a bit, depending on the sort of paper that you have. Um, and you know, maybe to make an example, you know, if you have an experimental paper and you want somebody to have a closer look at the setup and tell you whether the, you know, what they've done is, is solid, that person, usually you want somebody which is like maybe a young PI or a very senior postdoc. These kind of people actually will look into the details. But maybe, you know, of course their opinion in terms of the importance is going to be nice, but maybe they're not going to be able to tell you, you know, how likely something is to, you know, become a technology or something because, of course, they're quite young. So it really depends on what you want to know. And then you find different people. And again, like, it's helpful to have somebody that has published in our journals because they have a bit of a sense of what we do, but we expand the pool, so we will necessarily go to somebody who has published in other journals. From my experience, if you go to somebody who has never published in journals that are similar to ours in scope, like, you know, PRL or Nature Journals, Science, something like that, sometimes they, are, they might not be entirely up to date as to what exactly we're asking them. So you maybe don't go super far, at least not on three of them. Maybe one you take far, and you kind of combine. So there is a lot of thinking behind it. There is, just behind you. Um, uh, regarding the, the black box, yep. what happens, uh, what do I should do with when eventually uh, the appeal is not answered? So you send the email to the, to I the send editor. Send an email to the editor, the editor just does yeah. exactly. So well, Very polite I mean, uh, and uh, uh, based on data and fact, uh, uh, 
well, appeal you have to, and I don't get any answer. You have two things to do. The first one is maybe check if the editor missed it or something. The second thing is if nobody's answering you, you email the journal. So the, every journal has an email address, which is ours is naturephysics at nature.com. You go on the website, you find it. That email address is seen by everybody. So somebody is going to see that. And you know, I, you know, essentially, my boss is going to make sure that I'm not going to ignore that okay. if you want. Thank you. So it's a bit nasty, but they should be answering you. <laughs> Normally, it's human. Like, I just you miss it. It should be a human, yeah. I mean, it wasn't you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, thank you very much. So you said before that uh, uh, um, nature is sort of trying to drive the research, uh, uh, fostering uh, uh, the cross-talking of different disciplines and uh, promoting new mm -hmm. journals. But uh, I mean, uh, nature uh, at the end is a company, a private company. Yeah. Uh, so how much is driving the fields and how much is controlling the fields due to the publish or perish? Uh, approach to funding research. So how much is, uh, uh, how is the policy uh, inside the editorial board that actually decides who gets the funding because it decides who gets to publish? So are there some uh, guiding rules for you? Do, sure. do you have some? Thank sure. you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big one. Um, so kind of deconstruct a bit what you, what you asked. I mean, this is a very relevant point. So the first one is you say that, so you rightfully say that our decision carry weight in terms of who gets funding and who gets tenure and so on. This is something that, so personally, I work for Nature Physics, okay, and I try to publish what I feel is going to be the best science I can put in that journal. I didn't sign up to become the person that decides whether you get a job. Unfortunately, this is what happens, and we are very mindful of that, and we try to do our job at the best of our possibilities because of that. But I'm not going to be taking my decisions on the basis of, hey, you know, I think you're good, so yeah, I'm going to publish you so that you get a position. That's not really, I mean, that's just not what our job is supposed to be. So I want to make clear of the fact that we don't ignore the power, if, if you want, we have. But that's not really what we sign up for, you know. I, want, I, went to, I, I would go to work for the European Union if I wanted to decide your job. That's not, you know, publishing is not what I want, you know, that's not the, the goal of my career. Now, this is one thing. The other thing is about driving in terms of, like, different journals and shaping and so on. That's a good point. That's an interesting thing. I mean, the fact that we're a company, for-profit company, which is not a mystery, means that it's very easy to predict what we're going to do, right? I mean, in terms of economic theory, we're going to go where we're not going to not make any money, in, if you want. So we very rarely pioneer things. We are very good at following researchers and giving them help. We're not going to publish a journal that nobody will publish in. So you kind of break new ground and we follow. It's not the other way around, because otherwise there would be no papers for us to publish. And since we're a company, it's very easy to know what we're going to do, in a sense. So I, you know, I, I know that we carry weight, but believe me, we, try, we really quite look into what the researchers are doing and try to follow and highlight what are the trends and so on. But usually we follow. We, we're not the ones dictating things. It can really seem that way. And believe me, you know, when you see nature physics and you see, oh my god, how many graphene papers, Believe me, we reject five times as many. So, you know, it's, it, it reflects the community a lot. So it's, you know, we kind of, there is an exchange, if you want. Of course, we give direction, but we follow a lot where the, the, the community is going. We don't really want to, you know, sorry for being a bit long, but I don't think it's my job to tell people what to do. But I'm happy to highlight where people think it's, you know, if a lot of people think that this is interesting, I'm happy to help them. So I kind of follow a lot. Thank you. Is, oh, sorry. My question is about uh, audience right. and how how can you select uh, the the audience and uh, how can you detect the the changing in uh, in the public opinion sphere? 
Uh, well, we, we do travel a lot. I mean, I'm here, right? So, <laughs> and we go to a lot of conferences and we try to talk to people because we want to make sure that, you know, maybe we want to understand whether people feel represented in what we do and maybe get a bit of feedback in terms of, hey, you know, what about this? You know, we, we do talk to researchers a lot as a kind of a sanity check. Um, at the same time, there is a bit of a strategic decision at the end of the day in the journals, right? Because, of course, you can, you can span the whole world of science. You make a decision and you go, okay, our journal is going to cover these communities, but not those ones. So, you know, it's a bit a matter of, like, how the journal is set up, and then, you know, the editors shape it a lot. So, you know, just to do a bit of self-advertisement, but, you know, like, for instance, for a journal like Nature Physics, you could argue, what is physics? We could stay here for two hours and talk about that. Where, for me and our team and our chief editor, the definition of physics, I would say, is arguably looser than it used to be maybe 10 years ago. We're very happy to publish something where it shows you know, physics doing something useful for society, for instance. Somebody would say, oh, but that's not physics. It doesn't really matter. That's like, you know, in a sense, that's the power we have to decide who we talk to. So I'm, I'm curious to know more about the financial structure of the Nature Group. Mm -hmm. In the sense, uh, the, some journals like Nature and Nature Physics, I think they don't ask for a fee to publish. Yes, correct. While others, like Nature.com, ask quite a lot. Yes. Scientific report ask perhaps even more. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether there are internal fluxes of money between the different journals, whether Nature Physics uh, is uh, self-supporting economically, and uh, just uh, a rough uh, figure of merit, how much is the publishing cost uh, per paper? Okay. In the sense, the, the raw data. Right. So uh, first, quest first answer, all the journals need to be self-supporting. Of course, the new ones will take some time to become self-supporting. So maybe at the beginning, you, you, know, you allow them to be a burden if you want. But then after a few years, you want them. Or you want to have a plan that will make them self-supporting at some point. I cannot go too much into detail, not only be because it's not really something I can share, but it's kind of above my pay grade. I don't really, you know, the financials is a bit of a mystery to me. Um, one thing, so the price is set in terms of like, what's the price of scientific reports? What's the, the price of nature communication? So by the way, just to clarify, the, the journals you pay to publish are open access journals. The papers you do not pay to publish get money from libraries because you have a paywall and you have a subscription. So that's the, the two models if you want. Um, the price is set against you know, how many papers they reject, against how many papers they publish. Because, for instance, just to give you a bit of an idea, I, I'm not going to try to justify the price of anything, but you know, Nature Communications is quite selective, and all the, all the papers that they reject make zero money for them, and takes a lot of time. So that price, that, that, that work needs to be factored in, the price, because it's work at the end of the day. Um, so in terms of a rough figure of merit, we are, as I mentioned before, as you might know, or some of you might know, the European Union is pushing quite hard into making journals open access with Plan S in a few years. So we are considering issues such as maybe making nature physics open access. According to what has been told me, because of course I don't know the wages of my colleagues and so, so I don't know the figure of merit, if you were to make nature physics open access tomorrow, with the amount of papers we publish and the amount of editors we have, it would cost around 10 to 15,000 pounds, 10 to 15,000 uh, dollars per paper, which is clearly completely unsupportable. So if you were to make nature physics open access, something needs to change because it's just not, not possible. So if you want very selective journals and very editorial heavy journals can work only on a subscription based model. Open access journals can publish more, but they need to have a different structure. I yes, but I'm okay. The, the figures uh, that you quoted uh, turn to be a bit weird if I compare to that uh, Dutch initiative of the fully open access uh, uh, journal. I don't remember the name, which is supported by some external grants. Is e life? No. No, no. Is the science? Is the physics one? Is um, or Cypost maybe? No. 
Exactly, it's high post. Yeah. So the price is completely in order of magnitude different. Absolutely. So I'm wondering whether, where is the difference? Because referees are for free, mm -hmm. are not rewarded, differently from uh, funding agencies. Yeah. The number of papers that an editor will handle, I guess, is comparable. So I don't really understand why one is uh, 15,000 and the other one is, I think, a few hundred. Yeah. Well, Cypost, from what I understand, well, okay, you know, editors in Cypost are still academics, right? So as opposed to me, I, I get a wage, not a massive one, but I still... Okay, but I don't think you will get, have one no. million per year. No, 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 yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> no, I wish, but... Um, <laughs> Essentially, you know, Cypost is close to an overlay journal, right? So you submit, and that's published as it is. There is no production and so on. I mean, the, so the, to answer, I mean, we can talk about this. Yeah, yeah. The question is a very correct one, and, you know, I would basically spin it as what is worth paying for? Is all the overhead that nature has in terms of, you know, we are many people, there is a lot of press, a lot of admin, a lot of marketing, a lot of whatever. Is it something that you would be happy to pay for? If the answer is no, fair enough, then everything is going to cost less. If you are happy with that overhead, then that overhead is going to be absorbed in the cost of the paper. So uh, I don't think I'm going to try and justify the price. I'm just going to say, you know, this is sort of like what we offer. If you say, I don't care about that for that price, which I agree with you, nobody is going to charge 10,000 because that's ridiculous. But if you, if you say, I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in that, well, I mean, that's fair enough. And I think that we will have to think about that very carefully in the future. The problem is that there is a sort of a problem when the Europe will impose a plan S where people are forced to do open access. Yeah. Because then either you don't want to waste your money into, say, into a high-level production company yeah. like yours, you offer a service, but it costs a lot. Yeah. If you want to go to some cheaper option, say Cypost, the problem is that my career as a researcher will be affected from that. So a sane way of spending public money will reflect on a bad result of my own career. Yeah. So this is something that I think the European Union should think more rather than just doing some I, plan S. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And I think that you know, if you were to take the element of the career out of the picture, then it's fine. No, it's then a Ferrari, it, either Fiat Punto. Exactly, exactly. Then basically we would need to say, okay, you know, we are Ferrari and we need to offer you a Ferrari. So we need to make sure that we are Ferrari. Yes. So, but you know, we're not the ones controlling your career. Yeah, the problem is that the European Union is controlling my career, whether I'm driving a Ferrari or a Fiat Punto. I know. Uh, I, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting, we're getting towards the political, so <laughs> it's better to, it's better to. So, maybe we'll be around home today, mm -hmm. uh, in the afternoon, so eventually you can find him uh, around our office. We are in the space of data science, so close to the direction, uh, if you have uh, other questions. Uh, so, let's thank again uh, Federico for thank coming. You.